ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the moderator of the one of the last sessions at the Habsburg stage, Steve Clemens. Hey everyone, I'm Steve Clemens. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm editor at, of, at large of The Hill in Washington, DC. Uh, I see we've got a couple of our panelists online. It's great to see you. Uh, and we've got people here who I think you must be the most obsessed people at Globesec with carbon taxes. So great to have you here. Uh, let me tell you what we're gonna be discussing. We're gonna be talking about EU climate diplomacy leadership and the carbon border tax. We may actually broaden this a little up because we've got Glasgow coming up in new November. Uh, there's a lot going on both in the transatlantic relationship, uh, but, but globally within this realm. And the topic that we're gonna be discussing today, and we have people who understand the technical dimensions, but they also are able to lift up to the big political and geopolitical dimensions of this. Um, and we have three wonderful things. With me on stage here in person, it's my first in-person per uh, interview here at Globesec. All my others have been online, but uh, great to have with me uh, here, Christian Engenhofer is a senior research associate at the School of Transnational Governments at European University Institute in Florence, and he's also associate senior research fellow at SEPS in Brussels. So great to have Christian with me. But Jennifer Hillman, my colleague and friend from Washington, D.C., we were online together just the other day for the Calorama conversation where we discussed exactly this topic with Pascal Lamy, the former director general of the uh, World Trade Organization, and Senator Sheldon Whitehouse and Genevieve Pons uh, from the Jacques Delors Institute. And Jennifer, we didn't get to talk that day, but I actually called when we were when we were online. I said Jennifer Hillman will know the answer to this question, and then you had already slipped off. But it's great to have you uh, here with us. And then, of course, we have Pascal. Uh, 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 Pascal Confin, who's chair of the Committee on Environment, Public Health, and Food Safety uh, in the European Parliament. He's just finished a meeting. Pascal, thank you so much for running out of that meeting to join us here and help us set the stage uh, on this topic. What I'd just like to say for a moment, and, and this doesn't have to be where the conversation goes, each of you can ask questions here in the room. Those of you who have the Globesec app can ask questions online, uh, and they will be fed to me up here, and I hope you will do that. I know we have uh, some viewers on Zoom as well. But let me just you know, say at the beginning that the reason that I had the opportunity to help moderate a discussion previously with people who were real ex experts in this topic, and I should say I'm not, I can ask the lay question and the silly question, hopefully some informed questions. But when we had Jennifer Hillman and many other colleagues in the transatlantic relationship online a couple of weeks ago discussing uh, the, the uh, carbon border tax with regard to this, there is a concern, I'm just gonna put it on the table, that Europe is evolving in one direction and the United States and other countries is evolving in another direction and that the lack of coordination, the lack of alignment, even though they both may have carbon goals, creates real complexities and problems in transnational firms and companies and regions. And so I wanted to say just on the outset that that's one of my real interests is it's something I hadn't considered as we talk about greater goals and carbon goals, as we get to uh, Glasgow in November, uh, that this lack of alignment was something that at least Pascal Lamy underlined as a serious concern from his perspective. So let me ask uh, another Pascal, of course, Chairman Pascal Confine, uh, 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 to, to join and, and help set the stage for what you see as the dashboard of concern as you look at uh, adjustable carbon taxes, border taxes uh, in this realm. Pascal? Yeah, so uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to to share uh, our thinking uh, in Europe about it. So uh, first, it will not be a tax. It will be uh, the mirror of the European trade scheme. So if the European carbon price is of 52 one day, the, ETA, the, 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 the carbon border adjustment will be 52 the very same day. If it's 40, carbon border adjustment will be 40. Okay, it will be mirroring the price paid in the EU. Uh, second, it will be the exact mirror on the volume as well, meaning that if part of the carbon is not paid by uh, European industry because they still receive uh, free allocations for part of their emission, then of course we will apply the very same scope for imports. That gives you uh, two examples of the way we want to design 
the carbon border adjustment mechanism that will be legally presented formally by the European Commission the 14th of July, so in exactly one month's time. We want to have it WTO compatible. That's a red line. We do not want to enter into a trade war on climate with our partners. It's a no-go for us. But the other no-go for us is that we would have a price of carbon with of 50, 60, maybe 70 to 80. We are as already more than 50 today. That will be applied to our industries. And then importers will play zero, zero on carbon. And then that would just put out of the market our own industry. So the, it's politically unacceptable, uh, for jobs reason unacceptable, and for climate reason, that would be completely counterproductive and ineffective because that would mean that that would be a huge incentive for not going green. <laughs> so that's why we need, as we enter into a new era of carbon pricing in Europe, in the past, the carbon price was, let's say, 10, 15, 20 euros per ton. You do not change anything with this. Now we are at 50. We will probably very soon go up to 60 and later on to 80. At that level of price, for some industries, you cannot uh, stay on the market with competitors paying zero. Right. So that's the basic equation. So I put there all the key elements that will drive our uh, proposal that will be made in the couple of weeks time. And again, in a very cooperative way with our partners, we do not want to be in a trade war. We do want to be within the space of WTO. If it is within the space of WTO and we know how to do it, then it is within the rules we all agreed. So that's why uh, I don't think it's a, I don't see the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism as a non-cooperative mechanism, but just as an equitable mechanism to make sure that we can move forward the climate agenda without jeopardizing our industrial competitiveness. Well, let me just, you know, we have uh, uh, Jennifer Hillman, uh, as I mentioned, at the Council on Foreign Relations. We've got Chris, you're going to come in. But I want to ask you one question, uh, Pascal, before we move to Jennifer, is, is the question of you're not a bureaucrat. You're a politician. You chair a committee. You, I'm just interested, you know, just given my own Washington orientation, is there kind of a strong, robust consensus on your committee that this is, you know, all packed up and ready to go? Or are there any elements of controversy and, and you know, difference of opinion as you see it in this area? What are the political fault lines that you deal with? No, there is a wide majority, a very wide majority behind what I, behind what I supporting what I said, meaning it has to be fair. Uh, equitable, WTO compatible, and if I take the US specific case, if there is no carbon price in the US for domestic reasons, then we have to make sure as Europeans that we take the implicit price on, of carb on carbon. Right. So the explicit price on carbon is either through markets or through taxes. But you can have implicit price on carbon through standards. If you put a standard on cars or a standard on aluminum and so on, you have an implicit price on, on, on carbon. Mm -hmm. And then it would be fair to have that in the design of the carbon border adjustment mechanism so that if the US put a standard on a certain sector, certain commodity, uh, without putting a price, we translate the standard into the, the equivalent of a price so that we do not double price the carbon from the US because that would be unfair from us to you. <laughs> so that's why when I say all of that, be, behind this, you have a very, very strong majority uh, across the board to support this idea. Well, thank you. Well, let me bring in Jennifer Hillman. And Jennifer Hillman is a senior uh, fellow for trade and international political economy, as I said, at the Council on Foreign Relations. But more importantly, she has been a trade official of the United States, the uh, International Trade Commission, the U.S. Trade Representative Office, in the worked in the WTO. Jennifer probably knows more about trade uh, than anyone else at Globesec, I think, but on this kind of area. But when it comes to these alignment areas, uh, Jennifer, about 
you know, what we just heard from Pascal on this subject today, do you share what Pascal Lamy put on the table that he, he worries that there's a lack of alignment geopolitically? And since you have a foot in, on so many different dimensions of this question, and you just heard uh, Pascal's comment on, on what we need to do, um, I'd love to get your sense of whether the United States is anywhere near that level of sophistication in approaching, you know, uh, a price on carbon. <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. And I will say I, I share, if you will, both Pascal's views. I mean, on the one hand, I agree with Pascal Lamy that there is a high risk uh, that what the European Union is doing could create tensions uh, with the United States and with others. And I would say maybe even more particularly with developing countries who are going to see this as falling very, very heavily on them. And at the same time, I, I want to agree with Pascal Pascal Confin, that I think the European Union has done a very commendable job of working to make sure that this proposal is, is fair and is WTO compatible. The devil is going to be in the details. I mean, the issues that were raised right here at the end, this issue where in the United States right now, uh, with the exception of our emissions trading system in California and a few other sort of smaller regional arrangements, where the way in which the United States is getting down um, its carbon emissions is entirely through regulatory mechanisms, uh, both through, you know, again, certain specific regulations with respect to how power is generated, uh, with regulations on emissions controls, on, on gasoline fuels and everything else, um, as well as incentives for the investment in renewables. That is very different than a carbon tax or an emissions trading system. And so, you know, what becomes very tricky is if the European Union imposes a, a, a charge in the form of requiring U.S. exporters to buy European emissions trading certificates, um, is that price, in essence, a fair one? Is it equivalent to what the European industries are paying? Um, and is there a fair way to say, oh, but I effectively paid at home in the United States because of the way in which my industry is regulated? And, and that's where the, the rubs could come. Um, and again, I share Pascal Lamy's real concern that the goal on both sides of the Atlantic is exactly the same to get to net zero emissions. I'm going to interrupt, Jennifer. Let me, let me just ask so that I understand. Again, I'm a lay person. We have lay people in the audience. We also have a couple of these young folks that are real experts, I think. But are you basically saying that American firm that has generated whatever widgets they're producing in that regulatory order may complain that they're being double taxed? Is that what you were, you were Correct. suggesting? Okay. Correct. Uh, you know, again, and, I, and again, I want to commend the European Commission and the European Union for trying to figure this out. And again, it remains to be seen. The good news for everybody is they're starting slow. There's only four industries that are, you know, in there in the very beginning of, of this phase, you know, and we're going to see kind of how it goes. So we've got steel, cement, electricity, fertilizer, and iron are the ones that are sort of out there at the beginning. Uh, but that's exactly the concern is that a U.S. exporter of steel is going to get charged. You know, they're going to be told you have to pay, you have to buy uh, emissions uh, certificates and the price of those is X. Um, and they're going to argue that that's not fair, uh, that some that the U that the you know European steel industry got a free allowance, so they didn't actually have to pay as much. That will be one argument they're going to make. They're going to argue, wait a minute, wait a minute here. I'm highly regulated in the United States in the following six ways, so I have effectively paid a carbon price already in the United States, and you aren't uh, fairly recognizing it. That's going to be the argument from, from U.S. exporters that are trying to get their product in, into the EU. And again, it remains to be seen whether they have a good argument or not. I can see Pascal about jumping out of his chair, like saying, you know, just waiting to wrestle, uh, you know, those people complaining down. But we've got Christian here. Christian, I think, and I, I'm trying to understand the technical dimensions of this somewhat, of a tax that sort of has a ledger where you've got, you know, inputs, outputs, and they sort of equal each other. But... I guess I'm used to thinking about, you know, the whole reason you put this in place is you're trying to create winners and losers, right? You winners and losers within the political economy, and you try to create winners that are going to be more uh, uh, environmentally sustainable practices versus losers that aren't or that pay for that. So I'm interested in what you see as the impacts of this kind of tax on getting to a more sustainable world, if you will, but also... Is the ledger really that balanced? Is there not revenue made? Are there not offsets that we should be talking about? 
Yeah, I mean, you, you heard it, and I, yeah. I, you heard the concerns, and I'm just wondering, hearing this, whether we are not creating a administrative monster with all these complications, devil is in the detail, and as we go, there are more devils and more details. Um, for achieving what? Uh, you mentioned, we uh, looked at, uh, in the European University Institute, we looked at uh, cement, just to do, do some back of the envelope calculations, and you see that North Africa, uh, carbon intensity is lower than in Europe, and if even in Ukraine is much higher, but actually the differences between the Europeans and uh, the and the non-Europeans, that cement is traded in Europe mainly, mm. is not that big. So the question for me is what are we achieving with this? And getting uh, to your question, we put out 10 years ago, so we have some uh, good credentials for carbon border tax, we put out 10 years ago a book and arguing for it. But I think by now the time have, has changed. We have now the Paris Agreement where we have one agreement of which everybody is part. And uh, what I think the big question for the future is, how do we incentivize this investment into the low carbon, the green steel, into the green steel, green cement, green chemicals, and so on and so on. So that's the big questions. I'm a bit worried we are protecting uh, the old industries uh, too much, and that's why my question to uh, Monsieur Carfin is, you know, why do we keep uh, the free allocation? Uh, why don't we go away, take the free allocation away? Because then the devils, the details are much smaller. It will be much, much more easy. And, you know, we have uh, a lot of money in the free allocation. We did some calculations using EU uh, numbers, commission numbers, and we talk about free allocation at the level of 350 billion in the next nine years. That's half the recovery package. Now, why do we keep this? And that's, I think, is a question for me to Monsieur Carfin, and maybe Jennifer certainly has uh, something to say. Mr. Chairman, what, is your, what are your thoughts, Pascal? Well, you know, I'm definitely not in favor of keeping the free allowances. So I'm exactly on the same line than uh, Christian. The Commission, the European Commission, will make the formal proposal. We will see what it will be. But of course, keeping freezing, I would say, uh, 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 the free allocation system as it is today, it would be uh, completely counterproductive for the very exact reason that was mentioned by Christian. Uh, back to what Jennifer said. I mean, you raised two potential concerns. And I try to answer and to anticipate this concern because we do have the same and we do want to be WTO compatible. So meaning that if you have free allowances, which we shouldn't have, back to what I just said and what Christian said, but if ever we have free allowances still in the system, of course, of course, the CBAM will have to incorporate this and to uh, make requirements for the U.S. steel makers only on the scope of uh, what is really effectively paid by the European steel makers. So no doubt about it, no issue. Second, explicit versus implicit price. You're right, and as I said, if there is a regulation in the U.S. that leads to the greening of the uh, uh, steel uh, production uh, in the US and that you can demonstrate that it is equivalent to the EU system putting a price on steel, no issue, and then there will be no CBAM. So again, I mean, we are working on it. So let's not create uh, just a bad buzz about it because we share the, exactly the same vision. But you have to understand the starting point. The starting point is that we cannot ask our industries to pay 50, 60, 70, 80 euros per ton of CO2 and being competed by companies being either zero or having no standard. So that's why with the US, we should be able to find the agreement based exactly on the current discussion. But with China, there will be no standard and a price of, let's say, one or two dollars. And Christian, was right to say that, okay, we have all uh, signed the Paris Agreement, but let's face reality. We are not all implementing the Paris Agreement, at least at the same pace. 
So I can't see how come I can go to the European uh, 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 j j uh, sorry, uh, uh, workers in the seed industry, in the fertilizer industry, in the electricity industry, and so on and so on. I say, okay, you're going to get fired because there is no uh, equity, a fair competition between you, China, and the US. I cannot do that. And politically speaking, no political leader in the EU will do so. That's why there is a wide political backing of the CBAM designed exactly as I just mentioned. Let me ask a political question of Jennifer. So I have uh, spent a lot of time recently with a controversial U.S. senator at the moment. He's sort of, you know, the, the senator that everybody wants to, to have to dinner, Senator Joe Manchin. And Senator Manchin in the United States is from a state called West Virginia. West Virginia is a major coal state, a coal producing state. And I'm just interested, Jennifer, in, in if we were to take the European model uh, that we're talking about, this border adjustable you know, tax, and we had that kind of application in the United States, what would happen to West Virginia? Because what I'm interested in, I'd also like to bring into this discussion, as we go back to that question of, you just mentioned China, and we have dissimilar countries also, you know, committing themselves to certain climate targets, and we have a kind of openness on how we get there. Jennifer Hillman co-authored a paper I highly recommend to folks at the Council on Foreign Relations site on the Belt and Road, uh, uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative. It goes into a lot of these issues, very worthwhile talking. But I'm interested in how, particularly in the United States, Jennifer, you help transitions. How do you fund transitions of people's lives you know, the work they do, you know, Pascal just talked about this. So I don't think America solves this with the power of a Joe Manchin until we begin answering that question. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Well, again, I, I think the U.S. has taken a lot of different approaches to the whole panoply of what you're raising in your question. I mean, one is what are we going to do on on regulating carbon? And and as you know, years ago, there was a, a you know, fairly serious proposals in the Senate for the United States to establish an emissions trading system, somewhat similar to the European Union system, where we would auction off um, permits to continue to emit. And this would have been something that the coal producers would have had to do. They would have had to purchase a fair amount of emission certificates and we would have had a trading system. That went through part way, but never got completely enacted. Then the shift was to go to a carbon tax in the United States. And there are still many proposals out there that may get support uh, to enact a carbon tax in the United States. Again, that tax would fall most heavily on coal producers and others because of the amount of carbon that is embedded in what they do. Uh, and the issue is then what would the United States then do in response to try to help those coal producers? But your question also raises just in general, what do we do for any American workers that are impacted by trade, you know, by imports coming in that they have to compete with or broadly? And there, I think there is a huge uh, recognition that we have not done well. I mean, we have simply not done enough to try to figure out how to transition both the individual workers and the communities that are heavily impacted, whether it's heavily impacted by imports or whether it's heavily impacted by a new carbon system, we have got to do better than what we've done. What we've done so far is limited so-called trade adjustment assistance, that if you can prove that you lost your job as a result of trade, you can get limited amounts. We've seen now with COVID a huge move to expand the amount of unemployment insurance benefits and others but this is gonna to have to be part of a broader package. Whatever adoption the United States does uh, for carbon adjustments, it is gonna to have to include a significant amount of worker training uh, programs. It's gonna to have to include investment in the renewable energy. So, I mean, what clearly the Biden plan is, is to encourage those coal workers to now become solar workers or wind workers or those involved in the production of renewable energy instead of being involved in the production of coal. And obviously, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to make those transition realistic and possible. Thank you for that. And I want to remind everyone that you can ask questions on any element of climate or you can ask a tax uh, obsessed question, too, because we've got real tax experts here uh, on your app or we'll we'll bring people up here uh, in just a little bit. But let me ask, you know, to go to Christian and all of you, you know, on this kind of broader question of how you transition economies. And I'm just intrigued with what, what, what Pascal has a, uh, what I would call an elegant and fascinating construct 
to look at something. And I'm always interested if Europe were able to achieve that and put that in place, does that create uh, uh, you know, that sophistication, that ability, that ease of managing you know, carbons and, and, and creating pressures in the right place, does that create uh, a competitive advantage long run for its industry and states versus China, versus India, versus the United States that have uneven uh, deals there. So do you, I mean, I'm just sort of looking at this as something that could be, uh, does it create for Europe certain competitive advantages that the rest of the world won't enjoy because it's just behind you? Um, Christian? You know, I, I have my serious doubts and, you know, sorry, Pascal, I have to come yeah. back to the free allocation and I fully understand that's part of the deal uh, to get this done. But if you look at the, the current system, uh, we are giving the free allocation to our existing installations. And if you're going down the route of green steel, so you green think just cement, to, for the audience, free allocation protects yeah. incumbents, right? Yes, that that you know protects the existing installation right. because they have a carbon cost right. and some other countries. So it's a way to seduce them in. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean the the bribe, you know, which okay. we did in 2000. I didn't want to say uh, the word bribe, but you know. Uh, yeah, but you know, I'm European. I can yeah. say that. <laughs> um, so you know, so what is happening now is that we are you know, subsidizing or you know, supporting existing installations for all the reasons which right. just Jennifer has uh, uh, explained. But once you go down the route of investing in low carbon cement, in low carbon steel, you don't get this free allocation. Huh? And that is for me the main concerns. If we want to be competitive in 2030, mm -hmm. we need the low carbon steel, low carbon cement. So how do we bridge that gap, sub supporting the old industries and don't give the same support or uh, uh, the support to the new industries. And in fact, we don't know what these new industries will be. Right. Will steel be s substituted by plastics? Will we have more so recycled steel? Will be using more wood and all this? Steel gets the allocation, wood doesn't. Mm. So that will be a big uh, challenge for us to be competitive in this 2030 perspective and beyond. Well, let's jump back to Pascal and say, am I right? All, I mean, respond to Christian as you will, but also answer my question, whether the regime you're building actually creates a long-term competitive advantage for those industries in it. In contrast to the U.S. side, which just, as Jennifer pointed out, is so uneven. I mean, you, I mean, I talk to CEOs all the time in the United States, and they are either working around government issues, or I talked to the CEO of Occidental the other day, going to build the biggest carbon capture site, but that's going to be a function of government subsidies. So you create a lot of unevenness there. That's why I'm interested in the, in the elegance of the plan that you're putting forward and talking about. And I'm just wondering in the long run whether that also creates strategic economic advantages. Well, so it's uh, our conviction. And then, of course, I'm not talking only about CBAM. I'm talking about the whole, the whole thing. Uh, what we call uh, in the European context, the Green Deal. So I know that in, in the US, uh, the, 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 the term is, uh, is uh, it's not mainstream, but in the EU, it is mainstream. Where everybody talks about the Green Deal. And the Green Deal means that we are going to change more than 50, 50, 50 laws, European laws, from now on up to the end of 2022. And on the 14th of July, the Commission will propose the change of 13, 13 laws out of these 50. And one of them is the CBAM, another one is the reform of the carbon market, and so on and so on. So that's massive. That's unprecedented and massive. And of course, if we do so, of course, the number one reason is climate. Uh, it's, obvious, it's obvious, and I don't have to elaborate more on this. Sure. But the second reason is that it is not only our duty to do so, but it is our interest to do so. It is in the, our interest because uh, there are a few industrial challenges ahead of us. Uh, obviously, the dig digital one. Obviously, the decarbonization of our economy and going net zero by 2050. And the one the Europeans can win is the decarbonization one. The digital one, we are still in the race. But to be honest, let's face reality again. It's mainly about the US and China. The decarbonization one, we are leading it. And the more we put standards in place, the more we've changed the rules of the game. But again, within the game of the multilateralism and the multilateral rules we set and we agreed on, 
that's the DNA of the EU and the European mindset. The more uh, uh, economic gain we want to, to have. And the big difference, so we are we, with the US, at least today, <laughs> it was not uh, the case in the past, but at least today we are 100% aligned on what where we want to go. The only difference, and it's a big difference between the US and the EU, is that you are one of the uh, uh, most uh, of the largest uh, fossil uh, exporter and producer. We are the largest fossil importer. We do not have any fossil in Europe. Now, it's very small scale for gas, no petrol, no oil and uh, coal, but we are committed to decrease it uh, exactly at the US. Right. We do not have shale gas and so on and so on. Because you are an empty continent, we are a full continent. We're full of people everywhere. Right. That's the big difference. Mm. And that's why it is even more, and maybe uh, <laughs> it would be contested by, the, by, the, by uh, Jennifer, but it's even more in our economic interest as Europeans to go greener and to decarbonize. Because we, when you look at the US, China, EU, the EU as a whole, so Germany plus France plus and so on, so on we are the block having uh, the lead on green patterns, on low carbon licenses. We are the leaders there. Right, right. Then second, China, third, the US. Right. So that's why we consider that it is clearly our economic interest to get there and to change progressively all the set of, the, of rules including carbon price, including CBAM, and so on and so on. And last point from my side, very last one, is that the political maturity in the EU of the debate of the relationship between climate action and trade is now real. It was not the case three, four years ago. Now it's clearly part of the debate. We do want to have trade. We do want to be open. We do want to be WTO compatible. We do want to have additional trade agreements and so on and so on and so on. But we want to be consistent between our trade policies and our climate policies. That's why we, for instance, we are probably not going to ratify the Mercosur agreement because we cannot sign an agreement now with Bolsonaro doing what he does on uh, climate and on biodiversity with Amazonia. That's, that's the core now of the DNA and of the global vision of the EU. And I hope, I hope that the U.S. will be with us on this. Well, uh, thank you for that. I'm going to go to Jennifer Hillman and ask her to reach deep down and find her inner trade warrior uh, and, and ask her, you know, as she looks at the WTO, she looks at uh, companies here. And as I'm listening to Pascal talk about what his hopes are in compliance, but, you know, just in the way you talked about, well, if, you know, steel industry can show that it has achieved equality here, you could, it just sort of seems to be what, go back to what Christian said, you create essentially machinery that needs to, that'll be, be good business for waivers and, you know, political calculations. And I'm just wondering, and that leads you to trade disputes. Jennifer, is there a way to do this without just a mountain of trade disputes? Huh, I think it's very hard to think about doing it because again, the, the basic WTO rules are you can only put a charge on at the border, a tariff, if you will, that is sort of in your schedule. And the schedules don't allow for this additional tariff to be charged on imports because of carbon. So the only way that you can do this fairly is to say that it is the equivalent of whatever your domestic industry is paying. So it is always going to require this calculation of how much does your domestic industry pay uh, for carbon versus how much are you charging at the border. So it's hard to see how you get out of that, um, you know, sort of mechanics of having to do that kind of a calculation. So uh, the, the concern that I would have, again, I, I commend the European Union. I think this proposal has gone as far as they could possibly go to trying to make sure it is fundamentally consistent with their WTO obligations. And, and for all of the reasons that Pascal has said, the problem is there is going to have to be these detailed calculations. And right now, the European proposal sort of puts those off to sort of private companies that would do this evaluating of whether or not this is the equivalent of that in terms of how much the carbon, uh, you know, was, was burned up in the production of a particular ton of product. Uh, that is, I think, going to lead to a cottage industry of, of those that are doing these kind of evaluations. And again, it gets back to the question that Christian raised, you know, at the beginning, is this really worth all of these details? And, and again, my own sense is 
um, it may be necessary as part of the transition. Uh, I think what the European Union is trying to do is to encourage everybody to join this. You know, an alternative, a completely different alternative would be to try to create some kind of a carbon customs union where everybody that is doing anything that is the equivalent of carbon pricing sort of gets together and says, we won't charge any of these taxes on each other. We will only charge them on everybody that's outside of the club. Uh, that would be an alternative uh, that would potentially avoid some of this litigation. Um, but I'm, again, I'm going to hope that everybody is going to hold off for a while in terms of challenging what the European Union has done because of how far they've gone to try to make sure that they are already WTO compatible. Jennifer, does China have to be in this somehow? Well, China has to be in the mix, uh, because if you look at what ha is happening in China, just to step back from it, if you look at who are the largest producers of solar, of, of, uh, of wind, of geothermal, of hydro, the, the biggest, best companies in the renewable space right now are in China. Uh, and yet, what have they done? If you look at, again, the Belt and Road Initiative, thank you very much, Steve, for commenting on it. But if you look at what they've done in that Belt and Road Initiative, they've exported 260 coal-fired power plants, uh, which are going to be up and running for the next 35 years, largely use, buying their coal from China. Um, and again, it is making it much, much harder uh, to think about climate change. So even if China does better within the Chinese market itself, we have to take into account what China is doing externally. And what they're doing externally is going in the absolute opposite direction of, of fighting climate change. So, I mean, anum, among the other things where I hope the U.S. and the EU can get together is on some serious financing limits uh, to basically say no more financing of coal-fired power plants, whether it's Belt and Road or anybody else, we should be saying just no financing of, of coal-fired power plants, period. Well, great. Well, thank you. We've got questions coming in. I want to come back in a, in a moment, Christian, understand this 350 billion euro fund. I'm always interested where the pots of money are. We'll have to go back to that. But let's take your question here. And if you'll identify yourself and we'll just all respond. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking my question. My name is Slavomir Hubatka. I'm from Technical University of Košice. I want to ask about uh, free allocations for industry in Europe. I will use steel industry as an example. Uh, you know, in Europe, the steel industry is one of the biggest emitters of uh, CO2 emissions. And A little closer to the mic. In Europe, uh, steel industry is one of the biggest emitters of uh, CO2 emissions, and most of their cost of emissions is covered by free allocations. Uh, is there a plan for a transitional phase in which the free allocations are reduced to zero, for example, until the year two, 2030, or uh, is this is it's not, there will be no transitional phase or the allocation will drop to zero suddenly from year to year. Right. And is there a possibility to create uh, industrial uh, climate migration? For example, U.S. Tilkoshitze taking back its uh, production back to back to America or, for example, ArcelorMittal moving their production into China. Right. Thank you. Great. Christian, do you want to uh, address that for a moment? Yeah, I mean, I probably have a similar answer than uh, Pascal. You know, we're having this big package uh, about ETS review and all of these points will be reviewed at some, uh, you know, at some stage or, or later. Certainly, we'll have to think about what we are going to do with this 200, 350 billion uh, free allocation, which is a big pot of money to drive exactly this uh, decarbonization in, in the future and avoiding what you're, you've been mentioning. But I would like to pick up the, the point, Jennifer, if I understood you uh, correctly. You, you see, you know, I, I tend to agree with you that the carbon border adjustment mechanism at some stage we will need, you know, five to, to seven years. And a question to maybe both of you, you know, is, wouldn't it be better now to use this very sophisticated proposal by the, by the commission, I think everybody agrees, as a sleeping gun to say, look, it's there. We are trying to be, we have it now ready. We will be using it unless you know, so things are moving. On yeah, you yeah. know, put the pressure. And I think that was the initial idea in the EU legislation to put right. the pressure, a stick, to get well, things Let me ask going. Jennifer to quickly respond and then I'm going to ask Christian to respond to our, our questioner. Jennifer, do you want to respond to... Uh, to uh, uh, well, again, the, the question raises, again, one, one of those devil in the details is this exact issue because as the, the way in which the European Union is putting out this proposal, again, U.S. steel companies or others that are exporting to, to the EU are going to pay this 
average price, average across all industries, all sectors, average price for their carbon for their their own ETS certificates in order to be importing. So they're going to, you know, calculate an average price. Uh, and then that price applies to next week's imports, if you will. Um, and, and, the, and the issue then becomes if there are a lot of free allocations in one sector but not in others, whether again, that, that creates some unfairnesses. Um, and and you know, the issue is whether or not the free allocations are in any way creating disincentives for the US, for, I'm sorry, for the European steel industry which, as Pascal has said, is way ahead of the rest of the world in coming up with green steel. Um, and again, I think what everybody is in everybody's interest is in encouraging Europe to keep doing that. Please help the world develop green steel technology. Uh, that's where we need to make sure that we have the incentives. And, and the question comes whether the free allocations help or hurt um, in that process of, of encouraging uh, the production of, of, of green steel within, within Europe. Uh, and whether or not the free allocations, again, create a sense of unfairness from U.S. producers that will say, well, I didn't get a free allocation, um, and therefore the fact that I have to pay on my export going into Europe creates an unfairness. Uh, thank you for that. Pascal, would you like to, to quickly respond to our questioner? Yeah, I mean, uh, let's not forget that if the starting point would be that uh, all the key players, the economic players, would play the same game on carbon act climate action, we wouldn't then be in here discussing uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism. Okay, so uh, let's let's not accuse the EU of doing something that is just trying to counterbalance the fact that others are not doing their job. I mean, we just try to be fair to all the others, but we have also to be fair to ourselves. Okay, so uh, again, it's it's a bit. Uh, uh, too easy to say, well, that's a machinery invented by the EU brain, blah, 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 blah. No, we just try to move forward on climate and please do so as we do so that we can, as Christian said, avoid, avoid having a carbon border adjustment mechanism. It's not our best plan. It's just a mechanism we need to uh, have it fair and equitable. And then regarding the question, because it's very important one. I mean, the, to my view, and then that's my personal view here. Uh, the best way to proceed would be to connect the amount of free allocations to the, ex the, the, the effective green investment uh, 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 made by a company X. So let uh, somebody mention ArcelorMittal. I think it was in the question. If ArcelorMittal invests in green steel, I don't know, uh, let's say 1 billion euros or 1 billion dollars, then you have free allocation to compensate. Because of course, of course, if you have to pay, I take the, the, the theoretical example of ArcelorMittal in Europe. If you have to pay your allocation, because it's not free anymore, so you have to pay 50 euros per ton of CO2 you emit. Plus, you have to pay the green investment to invent green steel, then you pay twice. And then it's unfair. Actually, you won't do it. So that's why we need to make sure that if you invest for real in a new industrial process decarbonized, then you keep the free allocation. If you do not, then you pay the carbon price. That's, to my view, the right balance uh, to strike. And that will be for the uh, reform of the carbon market, uh, uh, which will be presented uh, in a month's time by the European Commission. Terrific. We have a minute and 42 seconds, but we've got a very good question from Jason Poon uh, on the app. It says, how can you assess the carbon emission of products involving many countries in their production chain? Will it uh, imply massive administrative costs? So I, I, I love this question because that is a really, we've been talking about steel and big commodities, but this is actually talking about the complexity of our world today that is in all the widgets we carry around. So um, let's, let's just have quick slices of this, snapshots. Uh, we'll start with uh, Christian, would you, would you, your thoughts? Yeah, we are starting with basic materials. Huh? It's yeah. steel, right. aluminum, and so on. We are not talking about cars where you have right. a lot of embedded. So that's doable. Uh, I say this way. just after we have had the airplane deal, right, on Boeing, Airbus, and the complexity of who makes what where. So that would that's, kind of probably that, yeah. gonna, that's probably easier than that deal, huh? huh. <laughs> Jennifer will know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Great. Jennifer Hillman, your thoughts? Well, I, again, I, I think the answer to the question is, if you were trying to apply this carbon tax to very downstream products, to cars or, par, or products that had components from all over, the answer is yes, it would be very, very complicated. And I think that's why, again, the EU has been smart. Uh, they're starting with just sort of basic commodities that tend to be produced in a single facility or by a single company. Um, and those companies definitely can make these calculations. I mean, in the United States, this kind of data has been collected for decades under our various clean air provisions. And so if you're limiting it to, you know, again, basic steel products, aluminum products, cement products, fertilizer products, the answer is yes, you can easily and I think fairly readily determine how much uh, GHG gases were emitted in the production of that particular ton of steel, cement, you know, glass. If you start to go much further downstream, it does get to be much harder. Uh, I'll say this, I'm going to give uh, our Mr. Chairman Pascal Confin the last uh, word, but in, the, in doing so, referring back to this conversation that the French ambassador hosted on this topic with Pascal Lamy and Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, I'll tell you that Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, whom I had invited to possibly join today, but he couldn't make it, said he, he actually applauded uh, this mechanism, thought it was great, and lamented that the U.S. government wasn't as aligned with Europe on these issues. With So, Pascal, that is a point in your corner from one of our politicians. So, last word, Pascal. Well, uh, you know, a carbon border adjustment mechanism is in the Biden platform, but to China. So, that's interesting because actually the U.S. the U.S. administration will be somewhere in the middle. That's why Kerry, when he came to Europe, said, I'm not against, I have questions which I think is the right way to have a good relationship between the EU and the US. You challenge us, we challenge you, but in a, but in a cooperative and a positive mindset, because at the end of the day, what we want is the exact same goal. Well, with that, I'm going to uh, close this session. I want to thank Pascal Confen, Chair of the Committee on Environment, Public Health and Food Safety at the European Parliament. Jennifer Hillman, who's had every cool job and trade in Washington, D.C. and probably uh, Geneva, uh, with the Council on Foreign Relations Senior Fellow for Trade and International Political Economy there. And again, check out her report on China's Belt and Road. Quite interesting. And here with me uh, in the room, Christian Engenhofer, uh, of both the European University Institute in Florence and the NCEPs in Brussels. Thank you all very much. Big, and thank you to those who uh, asked questions. So a big round of applause for our panel. And in five minutes, we're going to continue with Václav Havel, Transatlantic Dialogues, the Russia Challenge, Where To Now? And I see some people have arrived for that. So thank you all very much. Mm -hmm.